Hello everyone. So in true cabbage fashion, I missed some details again in my last QBZ191 video. So I want to make the second follow-up video to address them. These details are pretty small, but I find that talking about them would allow me to expand into some interesting implications in firearms design. So stay tuned if you're into that. And of course, I will be going over some new information that has come out since my last upload, but there won't be nearly as much as last time. Finally, before we begin, I'd like to announce that I have made an Instagram page. As you can probably tell, I don't upload very frequently on YouTube, and that is because I want each of my videos to be kind of a one-stop shop about a weapons platform, where you can just watch that one video to get a thorough understanding of said platform. The thing is, the amount of effort required for one such video is pretty extensive. For example, I probably spent at least three times as much effort on this video than on my capstone project in university, and I don't know what that says about me as a student. These high effort videos means two things. One, I am very hesitant to start a new video because I'm lazy, and two, I frequently find myself stumbling across a lot of small tidbits about multiple platforms, but not enough info to make a comprehensive video about any individual one of those platforms. But regardless, I find those tidbits very interesting and I want to share them, so this Instagram page would be an outlet for me to release those small chunks of info in a less organized manner, but a bit more frequently. You can also expect to see some behind the scenes work from my YouTube videos on there as well, so if you're interested, drop by and give me a follow. Sorry for the long self plug, let's begin the video. Alright, this clip went around while I was editing my video, and I figured that I'll address it first, since I'm sure that there will be a few comments on it. As you can see, the clip shows the QBZ191 key holding. Thanks to the people on Sino Defense Forum and Weisin, who immediately came in clutch with their analysis, we now know that the guns in that clip were likely using rubber ammunition, since it does not chew up the walls of the shoot house like ball ammo. And accuracy is not a concern when you're just shooting within a room. It's likely the DBF-07 loading, as shown here. How do we know that it's rubber bullets and not the QBZ-191 being trash? In that video, we can see the shell casings are copper-colored, which is what the DBF-07 uses. While there are some older 5.8 ball loadings that use copper-washed casings, given that the people in the clip were doing shoot-house training, I think it's more likely that it's rubber ammunition. Another thing to look for is the ejection pattern. I'll replay it a few times for clarity. Now compare that to a live fire video. Ejection in the keyhole video looks much weaker, which makes me more inclined to believe that it is indeed not a standard loading. Nevertheless, we know for sure that it is not DBP-191 that is keyholing. Of course, DBP-191 being the ammunition designed specifically for the QBZ-191, which has a green lacquered steel case. All the videos that I have seen from the people who were issued DBP-191 show their guns working fine. Like come on, the Chinese has been designing guns chambered in 5.8 for over 30 years, I'm sure they know how to make their guns not keyhole. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. The first thing that I just want to get out of the way is that the maximum magnification of the QBU191 scope is 8.6 times, which is weird. Also, the designation for this optic is QMK191. There have been some footages of the PLA training to shoot the QBU191 in fully automatic, so it seems like QBU191 gunners are performing kind of the same role as M27 gunners in the USMC, alternating between being a designated marksman and an automatic rifleman. The QBU-191 is also compatible with old QBB-95 or QJB-95-1 drum magazines, which have a capacity of 75 rounds. Now let's go over the trigger pack. I was generally correct about the QBZ-191 fire control group being this design, which was inspired by the AK. I found this video where the shooter has to take off the safety to cock the gun, which supports that theory. This is a prominent characteristic of AK-style trigger groups, 
the safety can be engaged with the hammer down, but if you try to cock the gun in that state, the safety blocks the movement of the trigger hook, so the hammer can't be cocked. You have to take the gun off safe to cock it. Also, did you notice the small cut on the selector shaft? I wasn't able to determine what it's for in my last video, but now I think it's there so that when you disassemble or reassemble the fire control group, you can just rotate the left fire selector such that this detent locks into this cut, which holds the shaft in the perfect position for you to insert or remove the right fire selector. It really goes to show how when you quote unquote reverse engineer a gun, the smallest and simplest detail can have an interesting function. Alright, now is the interesting part. In my last video, I modeled the QBZ191 trigger pack based on this patent document, specifically this figure. Note the position of the auto sear. It is in the way of the hammer as opposed to in this other figure, where it is moved forward and out of the way of the hammer. When I modeled the fire control group, I assumed that in this diagram, the hammer is being held back by the trigger hook. So as you can see on the model, the trigger hook is in contact with the hammer stud. And since the auto sear is in the way of the hammer, I put a slight gap between these two engagement surfaces. In a production firearm, you cannot make the tolerance close enough that both the auto sear and the trigger hook touch the hammer at the same time. Either one of those must engage the hammer before the other. I assume that in this diagram, the trigger is holding the hammer, so I made it so that the auto sear is not. However, if we take a really close look at this other figure, you can see this tiny protrusion. That is the trigger hook, and it is not touching the hammer stud. Also in this diagram, this edge of the hammer is almost on the same level as this edge of the disconnector. Now if we go back to the previous diagram, we can also see that the relative position between the hammer and the disconnector is the same. This means that in these two diagrams, the hammer is at the same angular position. And since the trigger hook does not touch the hammer stud here, it also shouldn't touch the hammer stud here, and in this diagram, the hammer is being held back by the auto sear, not the trigger. So the model that I made last video is wrong. The correct way to model the QBZ191 trigger pack is that the auto sear must engage the hammer before the trigger. So as you can see here, the auto sear is touching the hammer, while the trigger hook is hovering above the hammer stud. This seems like a minor detail, but it is actually very important. To the best of my knowledge, every automatic weapon which uses an auto sear has the auto sear engage the hammer before the trigger, and by that I mean as the hammer strikes forward, it hits the auto sear first and then the trigger. Now that I have modeled the QBZ191 correctly, it does this as well. This is not a coincidence. Let's say that we do it the wrong way and made the auto sear engage the hammer after the trigger. Now imagine that you're a Chinese Carl Casada and you're filming a mud test video with your brand new QBZ191 to upload on Billabilly. The gun fires once, it cycles, but fails to go into battery just slightly. Now the hammer is being held by the auto sear. You release the trigger, but the trigger does not re-engage the hammer because the hammer is already rotated past the engagement point. Because the gun didn't fire, you inspect it, and see that the bolt carrier is open slightly. You decide to tap the charging handle forward to assist it into battery. Hopefully you are following all the rules of gun safety, because now the bolt carrier trips the auto sear and releases the hammer. You just had an accidental discharge. Now let's look at the correct way to design a fire control group. The auto sear engages the hammer before the trigger. You fire and the gun does not fully go into battery, now the hammer is being held by the auto sear. And because the trigger hook engages the hammer later, as you release the trigger, it falls into place ready to catch the hammer. You tap the charging handle forward, the bolt carrier trips the auto sear, the hammer falls forward and rests on the trigger hook. You can fire the gun normally again. Now at this point you may wonder, what if the gun goes out of battery after the auto sear has been tripped? Let's say you perform a press check and slowly ride the charging handle forward, such that the bolt carrier stays slightly open. 
The trigger is holding the hammer back, and the hammer is rotated past the point where the auto sear can fall into place and catch it. If you pull the trigger now, the hammer falls on an out-of-battery gun. This is when other safety mechanisms come in. If you remember, in my last video I mentioned that the QBZ191 bolt carrier is similar to the AR-15, where the firing pin follows the bolt carrier. So if the bolt carrier is slightly retracted out of battery, the firing pin is also retracted away from the bolt face, and even if the hammer strikes the firing pin, it won't go far enough forward to hit the primer on the cartridge. In conclusion, the QBZ191 is a safe design. After I uploaded my previous video, I thought about the fire control group that I wrongly modeled, and how the trigger engages the hammer before the auto sear. Then I went, holy shit, that's dangerous. But then I thought, did I manage to catch something that the entire Chinese design board missed, or am I just wrong? It turns out that I was just wrong. No shit, right? But yeah, that mistake made me think more deeply about firearms design, and it's fun. On another note, the QBZ191 hammer has this weird protrusion. If we pull the hammer back all the way, like this, we can see that this protrusion hits the floor of the fire control group, which limits the motion of the hammer preventing it from smacking against the disconnector. This feature means two things. First, it prevents trigger slap, a phenomenon that can occur in some guns where the hammer impacts the disconnector so hard that it pushes the trigger forward and causes pain and discomfort in the shooter's finger. I have heard that some AKs have this problem. The second thing is that the hammer hitting the disconnector with such force can negatively affect the service life of the disconnector. Some HK416 variants have a sheet metal guard that protects the disconnector, but in the QBZ191, this is built directly into the geometry of the hammer. So yeah, a pretty refined design from the Chinese. Now that we're done with the trigger pack, let's talk about one interesting thing that a commenter has pointed out about the QBZ191 bolt. Even though it is a piston gun, the bolt tail is still present. On the original DI AR-15, this bolt tail is necessary to prevent the high-pressure, high-temperature propellant gases from entering the firing pin channel, but this is not a concern on an external piston gun. The commenter also pointed out that on a lot of AR-18 derivatives, the bolt tail is deleted to improve the mass ratio of the bolt carrier group. Just FYI, the mass ratio is the mass of the bolt carrier divided by the mass of the bolt, and the higher the number the better, since the bolt carrier will have more inertia relative to the bolt, which means that it can close the bolt more easily. Anyways, I looked a bit more into piston AR variants, both AR-15 and AR-18, and yeah, a fair bit of them has no bolt tail, like the SCAR, the HK416, and the SA-80. My guess as to why the QBZ191 still has a bolt tail is that it's just a simple way to have a surface that limits the forward movement of the firing pin, in the original AR-15, the bolt tail blocks the firing pin from protruding too far from the bolt face. As the amount of firing pin protrusion is a critical dimension, the limiting surface must be on the bolt itself, because let's say, if the limiting feature is on the carrier, the tolerance between the carrier, the cam pin, and the bolt would lead to inconsistent protrusion. Of course, guns without a bolt tail still have other ways to limit firing pin protrusion using the bolt, like for example, the scar has this extra flange on the firing pin that stop at the back of the bolt stem, in addition to this flange that interacts with the firing pin retaining pin. This is a bit more complicated than on the AR-15, where one flange performs both functions. The back of this flange interacts with the cotter pin, and the front interacts with the bolt tail. However, you can still delete the bolt tail and only have one flange if you just move the firing pin retaining pin forward, like on the SA-80. This is where the QBZ191 is a bit quirky. As you can see in this diagram, this slot for the fixed ejector must go all the way back here, so you probably cannot move the firing pin retaining pin forward and still retain this capture function that I described in the previous video. Another thing is that, notice how there's this shoulder in the bolt carrier? In this diagram, the bolt is in the unlocked position, and this shoulder also interacts with this flange to prevent the firing pin from going anywhere near the bolt face, as an out-of-battery safety mechanism. This is also how it works on the AR-15. If you want to delete the bolt tail, you'll have to move the shoulder forward by the same amount, and as you can see, if you move it forward to about here, 
there is no shoulder, because from this point onward, the internal diameter of the bolt carrier must be large enough to accommodate the bolt body itself. So yeah, I think that all of the reasons I have mentioned is probably why there's still a bolt tail on the QBZ191. It's just a well-tested design that involves so many functions of the AR-15 style bolt carrier group. And besides, I don't think there's enough material in this bolt tail to significantly alter the mass ratio, especially when you have a buffer weight in the receiver extension that you can increase in mass. Alright, the next interesting feature of the QBZ191 bolt. Do you remember how in the last video I said that the lengths of the locking lugs are different? Now that we look closer, we can see that it seems like the locking surfaces are a bit slanted. This probably indicates that the QBZ191 has a helical set of locking surfaces. What I mean by that is, these four locking surfaces are parts of one helical path, kind of like an interrupted thread. This is similar to the locking surfaces on the AK, in the sense that they are also on the helical path, unlike in the AR where the locking surfaces are all perpendicular to the length of the bolt. The advantage of the helical locking surfaces is that it allows for a primary extraction. It means that when the bolt starts to rotate, even when the locking lugs haven't cleared the barrel extension, there has already been a very slight rearward motion of the bolt. This helps with two things. First, the case is allowed to work itself loose from the chamber walls just a little bit. Second, this slow initial acceleration of the bolt means that the force on the extractor is gradually increased. Compare this to the case where there's no primary extraction. Not only that the case hasn't been able to wiggle loose, as soon as the bolt finished rotating, it immediately accelerates from 0 to 100, resulting in a higher peak force on the extractor. So yeah, primary extraction is pretty cool. As Dugan Ashley says, it is for the extractor's pleasure. And I bet that the QBZ191 extractor would really appreciate it, since the gun uses steel-cased ammo. And did you notice how I use clips from this channel in a lot of my videos? Please just go watch that channel. I don't know who's behind it, but in my opinion, this is the best small arms animation channel on YouTube. Even though there's no narration at all, every single one of their videos goes into so much details, it's insane. I'm pretty sure that out of all the AK animations out there, this is the only one that covered the helical locking surfaces and anti-pre-engagement. Now onto the next detail. I located this other patent, which explicitly states that the purpose of this tab on the extractor pin is so that this nub on the bolt carrier can retain the extractor pin in the bolt. So yeah, I pretty much hit the nail on the head for this one in my last video. And yeah, this patent clearly shows the cam pin locking mechanism. You can see the locking lever and the slot on the cam pin that it locks into. That's everything I have for this video. It's a pretty short one and I didn't have a lot of new information. I just thought that the new information that I did have can start some interesting conversations about small arms design, which is what I like. And yeah, there's nothing that I want to say about the QBZ191 that I haven't said already. I think they're pretty solid. Anyways, with this video I feel like I can conclude the QBZ191 series. At this stage, I am fairly confident that the information that I have presented thus far is really close to being correct on how these guns work and hopefully I don't have to make another video to clear up any mistakes. I'm pretty sure that there will be some minor stuff that come up, for which I'll just post updates on my Instagram, as well as the YouTube community tab. So yeah, I've really enjoyed the research process for these videos, because there's just enough formal documentation on the QBZ191 that I still have to derive a lot of info on my own. This is why I didn't do a video on the AK or the AR-15, because they're so well understood at this point that it would just feel like a giant literature review. Well, thank you for watching this video, a special cookie for you if you have watched all three of my QBZ191 videos from beginning to end, and I will be looking for some other firearms platform that I can make an info dump on. Bye bye.